We now have the second part of our session. And to talk about this, we have Tanya Rubin. Tanya is a senior manager in the audit and advisory group. She advises diverse group of clients in a variety of industries, including entrepreneurial business, investment companies, manufacturing, wholesale and distribution, professionals, commercial real estate, and retail. She's an honest and reliable professional. She's knowledgeable in a broad range of industries and provides exceptional client service. She is motivated by helping clients reach their organizational goals and enjoys assisting clients and seeing them succeed. When she's not in the office, she's active in community and devotes her time to the Ice Chime Day School Mothers Association, where she's a co-treasurer. Joining her is Lon Rapkin. Lon joined uh, Crossoverman in 2007, is manager in the firm's audit and advisory group. He serves clients from a variety of industries, including automotive, real estate, and media. He also works closely with investment and public companies. He enjoys relationships he has formed with clients and is dedicated to seeing them succeed. When advising clients, Lon provides professional opinion coupled with business equity. When he is not in the office, he lends his expertise and energy to community initiatives. He is the committee member of United Jewish Appeal Accountants Division and a member of the Canadian Jewish Political Affairs Committee. He is the firm's ICAO tax cleaning coordinator and organizes free charter accountant tax clinics for low income individuals. So if you want it free, you've got to show him the certificate of your income, it should be very low. <laughs> Lon is also firm's co campus recruiter. And we have this wonderful team uh, who's so active in community. Please help me welcome Talia and Lon to take us through the next session. Thank you for uh, having us again. Um, hopefully everyone enjoyed dinner. And, uh, can everyone hear us? Me? So we're going to take a different approach instead of uh, Alan and uh, Ellie swapping. Me and Talia are going to stand up here and give you guys our, I guess, uh, one in three. We're going to talk about one in three. Do our best to try to tell you why finance is fun. Uh, but really, we're going to go through uh, financial statements um, to help you read and analyze financial statements. Uh, to introduce you to the different components of financial statements and the concept of accrual accounting. And we're going to give you some tools for analyzing financial statements. And then at the end, we're going to go through a couple of, uh, I guess, real life financial statements. Uh, they're actually clients of ours, but I took the names off because uh, we're definitely not allowed to tell you who they are. Uh, so we'll give you a, kind of a play-by-play -play on you know, what we take away from the statements, how to read them, what you guys should look out for when preparing your own financial statements. Um, so before I continue, has anyone ever prepared their own financial statement? All right, great. So you're going to come up here and uh, lead us. Right here, too. Oh, so we're done. <laughs> OK. I guess we can uh, definitely take you guys through. Um, so we have. The four statements that we're going to be talking about um, that Talia is going to start off with is uh, the balance sheet, uh, income statement, statement of retained earnings and equity, and uh, the cash flow statement. So those are the four areas that we're going to focus on, uh, give you guys a little bit more to know about what each of those statements actually consist of, and um, some of more elaboration on what we actually do with those statements. Uh, so without further ado, Talia is going to take away on the balance sheet. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so the first page of the statement usually is the balance sheet. It shows the assets, liabilities, and equity of the company. It's basically a snapshot at a point in time, usually the year end of the company. In that first year, you may not have the full 12 months, but after that, there would be. It's um, basically the assets are on the top. That's the items that the company o owns. Um, Examples are cash, accounts receivable, inventory, equipment. And the liabilities come next. That's what the company owes. Accounts payable would be there. Taxes payable, unfortunately. Um, debt, if you have any financing, that would be there. And things of that nature. And last, you'll have the equity. The equity is 
and basically what you've put into the company and whatever's been retained over time. Okay, so you, one has to remember, of course, the balance sheet is made up of, the balance sheet is made of, all the items listed on the balance sheet are at their cost, meaning what they were on the day you bought them or the day you, you signed up, you owe them. It's not at all the value on the date of the statement. It's not fair market value or it doesn't increase in value. It's what you actually paid for it. Um, this, so you're going to have your cash, your inventory, your receivables, and your property. These are items that will usually generate, your AR and your inventory will generate income. Um, your AR is what you get, of course, your cash receivable. When you sell something, you, you, know, you make the invoice. That's what you still have to collect. Usually there's terms, 30, 60, 90. Your inventory is your product. That's what you've paid for the item. It's not what you're going to sell the item for. The balance sheet is, the assets are usually listed in order of liquidity, meaning um, how easily you can turn them into cash. So cash is obviously usually first, then AR, then inventory, and so on and so forth. Liabilities. That's what the company owes. That's not the fun stuff. It's usually listed um, based on their due dates. So AP, AP, usually first, taxes payable may be more current, that may go first, and your long-term debt would be underneath that. Shareholders' equity, or also referred to as retained earnings. This is basically the original investment that the shareholder has put in, the, the money, the seed money, plus any um, amounts that they've retained over time, meaning if they earned profits but they didn't take them out, either through salary or through dividends, that gets added into your pool and it becomes your retained earnings. Your, the calculation is obviously opening retained earnings plus the current year's earnings, less any dividends, which, are, which is the money that is paid to the shareholder, and that equals your closing retained earnings. Your balance sheet is your assets equal your liabilities plus your equity. Okay, now you have your income statement. So the income statement is what we have next. Uh, this kind of ties in more to Alan and Ellie's presentation that we had for dinner, um, talking about where, where is the bottom line. Uh, it really shows you uh, what your profit is, what your gross margin is. Um, it's usually stated over a period of time. Uh, for those of you that are just starting up a company, that's going to be from your, your date of incorporation to your year end. Uh, your year end, obviously, you're going to elect on uh, with some sort of advice that you're given from some professional, or if you want to just use a calendar year, you'll use a December 31st year end. Uh, so usually the, the, the income statement is for an entire year, uh, but you might come across where it might be a little bit longer for certain situations, but not that much longer than a year, but it could be a, a shorter than a 12-month period. Um, so it reports your revenue and expenses of the company. Uh, as I think Ellie was trying to point out, it will show you your gross margin. And the way that I like to um, at least show it is, you know, put it in terms that everyone is familiar with. Uh, if you're going to own a bar and you can sell um, a bottle of beer for, for $10 and your, your cost is going to be, I'll call it on the higher side, about $7, you're going to have a, a $3 profit right there. Uh, so you're going to know that you have a 30% gross margin, and you're at least going to know that you got to, uh, your expenses can't be higher than that 30%, or else you won't be a profitable company. So really, your, your income statement is going to tie in uh, directly into your, your budgets and your forecasts. Um, and, and this is something that you know, a lot of our clients like to look at. They look, like to look at the bottom line, their gross margins. Um, so we do spend a lot of time with clients on their income statements. Uh, statement of cash flows, uh, again, ties into our presentation that happened before dinner. Um, this isn't really part of everybody's financial statements if you're preparing on your own or for like the first time. Uh, these are usually in included in uh, more audit or review engagements that we prepare for clients. Uh, but this really shows you where, where the money is going uh, or where it's coming from. Again, stated over a period of time. Um, and it's always intertwined with your financial statement date uh, or your period. So if you're doing a shorter period, that's going to show you um, the condensed version of where the cash inflows and outflows were going. Um, it really, uh, used to, I guess the major components um, are itemized under the following headings of your cash flow analysis, which would be your operating, your investing, and your financing. 
operating would be uh, differences between your current year uh, and your prior year. And, and I guess examples would that be like uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable, your inventory. So the, the changes between those assets or in liabilities uh, would give you your idea of you know where your increase and decrease in cash. Your investing would be you know if you're purchasing property, plant, and equipment. Uh, so that would be outflows of cash. And financing, if you are looking to you know buy a building or take out a loan, uh, that's where you would see cash outflows. Um, if you're getting uh, silent investors or if you're just getting other shareholders involved in your company, you would see cash inflows on, under the financing section of the cash flow analysis. Notes to uh, financial statements. Again, not a requirement for all companies. Again, we, this is usually for like reviews and audit engagements. Uh, but if you want to have notes to financial statements, really what it does, it gives you more of a background on certain balances on the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow analysis. Uh, it really gives the, the reader an idea, a better idea, of what those balances are really pertaining to. Um, and it really just provides additional support uh, for the users to understand uh, the financial statements. Is that an asset it's on the balance sheet? Yes. Okay. And um, so, if you were to sell, how would you feel like, the numerical value? Mm -hmm. how, how is it judged? How is it valued and how, how is it charged? It depends. There would be a, a lot of management it's estimate. Uh, how do you value it if you sell it? Usually, when I, clients that I deal with that have intellectual property uh, would have some form of an outside consulting firm come in and, and give a value to that uh, piece of intellectual property. Um, and really, we don't, management could give you uh, the idea of what they think it's worth, and it, depending on what type of engagement we're involved with, uh, we might just take what management says. Well, it's not so, so much us. CRA will, will allow, may question it, right? If you sell it, like what your cost was for it. So you would need to have some sort of proof, which could be a third party, to show what the cost is. Because obviously, it would be, a, it may be a capital gain. So you, they'd want to prove for the numbers. So, that's so when that intellectual property is reflected on your financial statement, it's reflected a cost. Whatever it costs you to create that asset, that patent, or whatever it is that you've got. And then when you sell it, sure, I mean, it, you know, you may value it based on the future cash flow or the future stream of revenues that someone can earn by using that patent. Is it so much a different same as Goodwill. So Goodwill, again, is uh, unless you purchase Goodwill, so if you buy a company and you buy the net assets of the company uh, and you pay a premium on those assets, that premium is probably a, a function of Goodwill. Okay, But if you start your own company, uh, you, you typically don't have Goodwill on your financial statement. You don't value Goodwill on your financial statement. Uh, so really, it's really just a function of when you buy something or when you, when you sell something, you may then add a premium to the sale price. Thing you should keep in mind about goodwill, which you may or may not know, is that there's two types of goodwill: personal goodwill, which has no value, and commercial goodwill. Personal goodwill is if you're not around to run the business, can the business continue? And if, if that's the case, that it can't run, then it's personal, and there's no value put on personal goodwill. Commercial goodwill is built up over time in running a business, is it the name, is it your client list that has really a lot more value than what, as Kalia and Lauren described, the shareholder's equity? Is, is the company worth more than the retained earnings and capital that have been put into the company? And obviously, if someone really wants your company badly, they may pay that premium and, and inherit goodwill because they're trying to get into a market they're coming from another country, let's say, and they want to establish a business here, and you've got inroads being in business for five or ten years, and they pay that premium, that would imply that there's commercial goodwill, and they're going to pay that excess. Does that help you? Yeah. Okay, we're going to continue on with fun accrual accounting. Alan basically um, talked about this before. There's a difference between accrual accounting and cash accounting. 
when doing your cash flows or your working capital or your break even, you want to use cash, the concept of what's coming in and what's going out. But for purposes of preparing your financial statements and what Canada Revenue Agency expects is it's accrual accounting. It's a concept of matching. Basically, when you sell something, the expenses that were incurred in order to make that sale need to be recognized in the same period that the sale was made in to make it, you know, to make the numbers relevant and mean something. So at year end or at period end, even at month end, you should be looking at your books and saying, okay, I didn't receive invoices for everything, but I know these items that are going to come, and when they do come a little after the year end, you then say, but it was relevant to my year end, I need to set it up, or it was relevant to last month, I need to put it into last month, even though I'm only going to pay it next month, or I've only received it next month. Um, at month end, at year end, everyone, the, all people go through and they, they find these invoices and they set up their accruals or their accounts payable. It goes that way with the receivables as well. If the service was provided or you've actually given out your goods, even if you don't invoice them at year end, it needs to be set up. So it's the day that you've actually provided your service or sold your goods that matters. Okay, there's another concept of materiality, which really only comes into play in insur assurance engagements, which is reviews and audits. Um, it's basically the auditor's judgment that a misstatement under this materiality would not impact the decision of the users of the financial statements. Meaning, let's say you have, it, it's very often based on your um, operating <coughs> profit, or sometimes it's total assets, sometimes it's pre-tax income, and there's certain percentages that you take of these items. And let's say if your materiality was 100,000, then you'd say, okay, well, all if, if it's a small error, 3,000, 5,000, even $20,000, that won't impact the users if the materiality is 100,000. Anything above that, we would definitely have to make a change, put an entry through, because this would, this would change the way the statements would come out, and it would change the decision that people would make by using these statements. Okay, next, analyzing your balance sheet. So when you would look at your balance sheet, there's certain things that you look at right away that kind of can tell you things about how your company is doing. Number one, do you have cash? Is your company solvent? If you have a positive cash balance, you're going to have cash in your assets. If at year end or at month end you have a negative balance, meaning you're drawing maybe on a line of credit or you're in overdraft, it's something called bank indebtedness we show it as a liability. So you want cash, don't want the other. Sometimes actually though, it, you may have cash in the bank, but you have your bank indebtedness, maybe you have held check, um, outstanding deposits, things like that. <coughs> um, the other, the next thing you would look at is retained earnings versus deficit. What is a deficit? Well, we were talking about shareholders equity before where it's the money you've originally put in plus all the earnings you've retained over the years. If you've taken out, oh, sorry, less your dividends. If you've taken out more than you've actually retained and put in, you'll have something called a deficit, where it's a negative return, retained earnings balance. That will show in your equity portion of your balance sheet. The next thing you'll look at is your current, ver there's two ways to see your assets and your liabilities, current versus long term. Your current assets are things that are collectible within a year. Your current liabilities are things that are payable within a year. Your long term are longer than that. Um, equipment, for instance, is an asset that's a long term asset. Um, long term debt would be a long term liability. You know, a mortgage payable or financing that you need to pay over a certain amount of years. Your usually your accounts payable, your taxes payable, things like that. Those are short term liabilities. Shareholder loans. That's a whole excitement in itself. The shareholder loans are basically either um, the money a shareholder, meaning could be an owner of the company or someone else who has invested in the company, um, what they, the money they've lent to the company or the money they've taken from the company. It's, if they've lent the money to the company, then the company is going to show it as a liability, meaning the company owes the shareholder money it's sitting in the liability section. That's great. You can take them. The shareholder can take the money out whenever he wants. You're in good. You're in a good place. 
The other way that you can see it is when you've taken money or the shareholder has taken money out of the company and the company gets to collect it back from the shareholder. That means the company has an asset. This can cause some adverse tax effects. So it's not a place you want to be. At, the CRA always looks at it at year end. So if on your balance sheet you have that shareholder asset, you may have some issues. Um, if during the year it sometimes happens, you just got to make sure that by year end it's all in the liability side. Next, okay, there's some commonly used ratios that you can use on the balance sheet to kind of gauge where you're holding. And we could go through those. The first one is the net working capital ratio. So the net working capital ratio is your current assets minus your current liabilities. This goes back to what Alan and Ellie were talking about, knowing how much working capital you have. You take your current assets, meaning your cash, your AR, your inventory, these are all items that can be turned into cash fairly quickly, less your current liabilities, and then you know where you're kind of holding, because you need to use that cash in order to pay off what's gonna be due in the short term. Your next one is your current ratio. That's your current assets, sorry? Oh. Current assets over your current liabilities. So that kind of means like how, how, depending on how large your current assets are, how it will it cover your current liabilities. If you have a current, a current ratio of 2.0, 2 to 0, that means you have two times <coughs> assets to cover your short-term liabilities. So you're going to be okay. Your last one is your debt to equity ratio. This is your total liabilities over your shareholder equity. It's a little bit more technical of a, a ratio. It's basically saying the proportion of shareholder equity and debt needed to finance your assets. So if you want to grow your business, if you take on a lot of debt to grow your business, you need to grow the profit more than you're growing the debt in order to make it profitable. So it's okay to take on debt to grow your business, but you want to make sure that the profit you're earning from that debt that you've taken on is growing faster than the debt. So you want your equity to be higher than your debt. I have a question. Sure. So clearly you're going to consider that when you become profitable, I mean, consider the debt to the generation we were starting up, right? Probably not, no. Okay. And can you, could you agree what networking capital ratio is? Current assets minus current liabilities. It's the same as your working capital, which is what Ellie and Alan covered. We, we give you uh, an appendix at the end of the slide, so you again, get, yeah. the slides are online, so you can definitely take a look there. There will be a whole list of uh, ratios that you can use to analyze your operations. Okay, next. Next fun stuff is analyzing your income statement. So in your first year, you only have a balance sheet with one column, which is just the, the year that's occurred. But as you go on, you will have a two column balance sheet, meaning you have this year and you have prior year. A very good way to look at how you've done this year is how you've done in comparison to last year. If you know last year was a great year and your numbers have gone down, I guess you didn't do as good. If you've done better than last year, then you know you've done better, then you're growing. You check, of oh, sorry. you check, of course, if your sales are increasing or decreasing compared to last year. You ch there's, and then, of course, you also you can check your gross profit margin, your, the things that Lauren talked about, your net earnings. There's some discretionary f expenses that you can put through, like management, fees, and salaries. When looking at how healthy your income statement is and how healthy your bottom line is, you need to take things like this out of the equation because it, it's not affected by how well your business is doing. You may just need the money to take yourself, you take a salary or you take a management fee. It doesn't matter if the company's doing well or not. So in order to evaluate if your company is doing well, you take out these discretionary fees. And then, and then do your calculations. Is there a standard percentage for management fees for any company? Sorry? Okay. No. 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 It's, you can pay nothing to yourself for as long as you want. So we heard about 10%, 12%, something like that. So no standards. No. No standards. No. No. Where did you hear that? Just uh, out of curiosity. Yeah, some people tell me like that. If you're going to bring someone to manage your company, you have to take a 12% from, from the well, revenue. Maybe what you're thinking of is a perfect example is a real estate company that manages properties. Yeah, something like that. They charge 
possibly five or six percent of, of the of the that's revenue. Right. That's right. That's what you may be thinking of. But if it's your own business, and if you are lucky to be in a position that you have someone else in your family that is earning, let's say, a salary that you don't have to, you know, in your first couple of years, take out a salary from your own business so you can have more funds to, um, you know, to help develop your business. That is why Tally was saying management salaries aren't necessarily, uh, are, are somewhat discretionary. Obviously, if you, you may need to take it out because you may need it to live on. But as you go along, as the business grows, you may have a base salary that you take that you would have paid someone else to run your business. Anything else is discretionary to see how you've done from year to year. So you, you would come up with, let's say for example, if someone else was running what you're doing in the business and they would give them a salary of $100,000, that would be your salary. So that, that would be your salary to, as a standard from one year to the next. Anything in excess, you would add it back to your bottom line, your, your, net, your profit, just to compare how you've done from year to year. Okay, what I need, for example, I'm, I'm starting my business now, I have my forecast. Right. Okay, and I do my business structure now, I know how many positions I need. Right. Okay, how percentage of salaries or fixed I, I supposed to do at that time? For example, if my, my revenue is going to be 100,000, right. so what percentage of salaries I supposed to pay? This is what I need to there's calculate, no, for no example. There's no necessary percentage because you need to know what positions you need and, and how I much it costs. I, 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 I need a manager, for example, two sales, one, something like that. Is Whatever. Okay, so let's say you need a manager and two salespeople. You have to figure out, find out how much would you have to pay them. And if they get paid a fixed salary, then you know how to factor it into the cash flow and whether what you can afford or can't afford. Salespeople, if you can, depending on the nature of your business, you may say, you know what, if, if you want to join me, I'm going to pay you straight commission. So that becomes a variable expense, and if the sales are higher, you get more money. If the sales are lower, you get less, and then you, then you know, okay, that's the commission rate, and you can factor it in. If you need somebody in the office, you may not be able to pay them based on a percentage. You have to spend, pay 50000 for that office manager to run everything, to, uh, while you focus on the top line, and that is sales, because that would be the key, then you know, okay, that's a fixed salary, the other is variable. Okay, I'm better meaning, is there something like administration cost, for example, percentage as well, or is it the same? It's variable as well? It, 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 it depends on the nature of the business. There can be a number, of, like, I, I've given you uh, those schedules to give you an idea of what administrative costs that you could incur, you know, be it office supplies, um, as an example, a telephone, to have a line, those are costs that you're, there's no necessary percentage. You just have to try to figure out, okay, call up whoever is gonna be a supplier, how much does it cost a month for, for, to run, is there any long distance charges, et cetera, et cetera. So for each one, you're gonna have to look at who your supplier is, what it's gonna cost you, do your research, and then incorporate it, okay? Just to, to build on that, like our bullet point there, uh, number four, your expenses to be in line with operations. Uh, you know, in, in your development stage, obviously you probably won't have much sales if you're in that development stage. But if you're, you're in a company that, you know, is actively uh, producing sales, you know, you don't want to treat your company as a piggy bank. So if you have uh, $10,000 worth of sales and you have $100,000 worth of expenses, something doesn't make sense. Uh, so, you know, in your earlier on stages, you should probably be careful of how much expenses you, you incur if they're discretionary um, towards your, your income level that you're generating. I mean, it's easy when in terms of development, but when you start with this first year, it's already the city short time. It's an operation. Yeah, I think compared, like you said, by, by prior year, but when you start it now. Yeah, the well, these is, tools, like when we're talking about like analyzing the balance sheet, analyzing the income statement. Really, we're talking you're, you're two, three years down the road. You're, you want to revisit your budget. You want to revisit your forecast. This is a good opportunity to go back, use your income statement, use your balance sheet um, to see where you can, you know, cut costs. Uh, you know, where where your peaks and valleys are in terms of your revenue generating streams. Um, so, at a, at a startup stage, yes, I would agree with you that you know it's difficult to like put a, a number on how much you should be allocating for those expenses. Yes. Um, so it's probably going to be what you incur. Uh, but just be careful on how much you're incurring based on your income level. I have a question from somebody who's attending a webinar. 
at what stage should a new business move to a growth accounting? What stage should a business move to a growth And <coughs> can you do that, engage an accountant, or are there software that you recommend for small businesses? That's the question. Accrual accounting needs to be done at the same time as cash accounting. For your cash flow and your working capital, you're on a cash basis. But accrual accounting is from day one. You, right away, need to pay taxes based on your accrual accounting. If you don't do it at, like that at the beginning and it comes to the end of year one and you need to all put it all into place, it's very hard. So it's kind of, they go hand in hand. You make decisions. You use cash accounting versus accrual accounting for different reasons, but you need to have it in place right away. <coughs> Banks also, they don't want to see cash accounting. They want to see accrual accounting. They want to see that balance sheet. They want to work their ratios. You know, if, you're, if you need financing, you need to show them that. What was the second half? The second part software. of the question is, uh, oh, do software. you need to engage an accountant, or is there a software yeah. as well? It's a hard <laughs> question for us. Do you want to endorse a product? Yeah, exactly. So do we want to endorse a product? Um, a lot of our clients use various um, off-the-shelf software programs. They're good. Yeah. They help them. We then come in at year-end, and we do what we need to do, but but on their for their day-to-day -day operations, you, you do need an off-the-shelf uh, software program. It doesn't do the same job as what an accountant does at year-end, but to keep you in place at the beginning, it's good. It also allows you, if you understand the program well, it, it helps you with your accounting. It tells you to do certain things. It, it it's shows you how to do things if you're really um, new to this. The last thing that you wanted to give us is a shoebox full of receipts. Yeah. <laughs> you you can't run your it's business that way anyways. The, the good thing about uh, off-the-shelf software, it will some of the cash flow concept or the working capital concept, it will generate those things for you. Like if you use it properly, it can do some of that for you and help you make better decisions and help you see how your business really is holding. I want to thank you on behalf of the webinar attendee. Sure. Uh, we have some questions? Yeah. All right. No matter what our questions yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to ask you, when you're starting out, uh, you don't have any money, so you know, you're know you bootstrapping, so is it better for you to uh, sort of advance your own funds to the company and call that um, a shareholder loan, or would it be better to get a bank loan, or does it matter? Well, there's two decisions that you make there. One, do you have the money to, to advance, and two, can you get a bank loan? If you can get a bank loan from day one, that's fabulous. That's great. If it, it's hard though, like they want to see kind of something happening already, and very often most people do have to get some personal funds. Collection. But, that's, yeah. the that's the trouble with banks. It's kind of a vicious circle, like it's they like seeing a history, right? Because they're they do a lot of risk analysis and they want to minimize the risk because they got to answer not only to the people they work for, but their shareholders, right? It's a public company. So as Talia said, it, it's, it's sometimes it's a combination of, bo of both because banks want to see that you're willing, are willing to take risk as well. So if you need $100,000 to start your business, how much will they invest? How much they want to see you invest in it is, is key, you know, and, and if, if you put in some money as a loan, which you would probably have to postpone, meaning you can't pay yourself back until the bank loan's paid off or until there's enough equity built up, which means profits built up, then it'll probably be a combination of both. And that's why they have through the banks these small business loans that are guaranteed through the bank, through the government, uh, but still there's a number of criteria, which I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head that you'd have to meet but some banks obviously have their small business loan department that will help you and guide you in that regard. Yeah. Uh, you said that banks usually look like uh, equal accounting, is that right? Yes. So, so let me give you a case, um, let's say a client uh, made an agreement with the company saying I will pay you after six months and then uh, let's say in uh, September. So at the end of the year, bank uh, is going to consider that as an asset or uh, as not? Is, that, is it a receivable at your end? Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, so let's say client uh, said, okay, I'm going to buy your product after six months, and um, he signed a contract. Oh. 
He signed a contract. Yeah, he signed a contract. So he's going to pay, a uh, client is going to pay out for six months, which is in February. He's going to pay, let's say, $100,000. So the bank is going to consider that as an asset? Well, it, it depends. Have you given him the product? No, not yet. It's just a purchase order with a promise to, for delivery. Then you wouldn't record it. So you don't record it? Okay. Yeah, so is the point in time in which you record revenue, usually it's when you deliver the, the product or the service, or there's a series of milestones or achievements you have to provide your, your customer in order to bill on a quarterly or regular basis. So the promise to purchase is not yet a true <coughs> sale. So once you deliver or provide the product or service, then the bank will accept that as a, as a valid, bona fide receivable. Like the credit payment, for example, if, you, if you're selling credit, the bank will consider it as, a, as, a, as an asset at time or a silver and rely on it. So I mean, the second scenario, oh. if I already delivered the product at the time and I, he would pay on credit payments, for example, after six or, or nine months, whatever. If there's a payment plan, the bank, in place, bank will consider it as they would consider that as a, uh, as a sale. Okay. That's it. It's a receivable. You've set it's it up as, a, as an accounts receivable and you'll get paid over six months and that will be an asset. And the bank will consider that an asset. Okay. Yeah, this uh, goes back to what Alan was saying. Um, where you don't mix up your personal <coughs> and business um, expenses and incomes and whatnot. Uh, what happens if I pump in, say, a certain amount of money in my business uh, just for, say, everyday expenses like, say, gas or you know, general, general expenses? Do I just at the end of the year or at the end of the month just uh, go ahead and fill out expense sheets and cash receipts and then collect that difference? Or do I collect that as a dividend? Uh, considering the fact that if I want to have the money stay in that bank account, I don't want to pull it out from, from my business. What does that qualify as? Well, I, if I heard you correctly, <laughs> advancing monies to a company as the question is posed before. That's number one, different than having expenses. Like, if you're going to buy clothes for your kids or yourself, um, and you use the bank's, the company's money to do that, that's personal expenses. But if you need to advance monies, that's just as, as Tally mentioned before, as a loan, as a shareholder loan, and it's kept separate on the accounting records of the company, that's just a loan. That money is used, yes, maybe to cover expenses of the company as a bank loan would. That's separate. So that that's just a loan. It's not paying for personal expenses within the company. And as the company makes money, you can pay back the loan if, if, if there's no requirement by the, if you have a bank loan, to not pay it based on the, the terms of the loan. If you incur expenses, let's say on your own personal credit card because the company is low on cash and you keep track of it and have the chits and file an expense report as, we, as an employee would at, at working for someone. They incur car expenses on behalf of the company and they file an expense report and you get reimbursed, that's separate. So I know each of the three areas I've just covered can be a little bit confusing the key is to keep business and personal separate for a number of reasons. Uh, too, too many to mention at this point. Company has a bank account, it pays for business expenses. That's keep it that separate. If you advance money, the company would record the loan, but it's now it's now a company's money. Just keep think of it as, okay, I'm spending money for the business, doesn't matter where the financing came from. Third, if you do incur expenses on behalf of the company because it's the, the, the money is tight in the company and you keep the, the receipts aside and you get reimbursed by the company, then you can track it. So the key in all of this is tracking where the money's coming from and where it's being used. Uh, and that's where software packages that was mentioned before can help, but it's also just you got to keep track of everything, and it, and it does get tricky, but those are the three things to think about. Yeah, so I guess um, 
in a way so it would qualify uh, as a shareholder loan because I don't want to pull that money back out. Right. Uh, and I did use it for the business. Right. For personal. Right. Uh, so do I have to show that uh, you know receipts in that case? Uh, usually you need that for uh, your expense. Uh, and I'll not if you've advanced the money to the company and it's put into the bank account, the corporate bank account, and that bank account was used to cover business expenses. It's already covered. Okay, but what if you used your personal uh, credit card? Well, that's where I gave you the example of filing an expense report to get reimbursed. But what if I don't want to pull the money out? Um, because when, when I go in an expense, I'm basically pulling the money from my business account now, right? But you're saying you're paying for expenses personally. No, I'm, I'm using my personal credit card for business expenses, but at the same time, I don't want to pull that money out. That's fine. So you can either get reimbursed, or if you don't want the money, then it just gets credited to your shareholder yeah. account. Yeah. And at a point in time when you want to take that money out, you can yeah. take that money out, and it's tax paid money. It's not a dividend or a salary. It's just a repayment of a loan you made to the company by paying those business expenses. So it qualifies for shareholder. Yes. 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 Okay. okay. And then, uh, what if you made some income that you recorded as cash? and you spent that personally, what would you do to, with that? Do you use that as, do you uh, put that as a dividend uh, in your company accounts, or do you put that as a... Uh, if I heard you right, it starts exactly. with that side of the word Talia said, it's like you borrowed money from the company. And what you're saying is, a sale was made, you, you personally received the cash, but it belongs to the company. Yeah. If you don't deposit it and use it for personal expenses, it's, it, it's as, if it, as if you borrowed money from the company. It can be, if at some point, converted into a dividend or a salary, um, but I would suggest you try to avoid that. I just actually had that situation with the doctor getting insurance income uh, for work he did, and he, we saw that last year he had similar income and basically used it to cover personal finances and now it's showing as a shareholder loan receivable. Okay? But eventually it could it has to be converted into some type of compensation or being so a like salary or dividend. Yeah. Yeah. Or salary. I think maybe I didn't come to the board of the body loan, but I, I think I'm just wondering I have one question pending actually in that Pardon? I have one question pending from WebSphere. Yeah. Sure. The uh, question is, what are the elements of burn rate? And what levels of uh, bandwidth of burn rate is acceptable for my investors? Is the question on burn rate like how quickly the cash goes through? Uh, I guess uh, the question is to understand what burn rate is, what it comprises of. And secondly, uh, what value of burn rate is considered normal by investors? I think it it's depends on, on on the nature of the industry. It's I, I believe if for everyone here the question on, on burn rate is how quickly you can that cash can be used up. It's, you know, you you get seed money and how quickly it gets eaten up. It, it really depends on the industry. It depends on how quickly um, you can turn that into to revenue. And each industry and, and each, depending on, on where the financing comes from, because it could be a, an angel uh, investor or an angel uh, provider. Um, off the top, I don't know the specific rate it would be, but I think it's all tied to the industry and, and the person or company that's providing the funding. And to add to that, it's also tied into the budget. So I think you've got to compare what's your monthly burn rate compared to what your expectation was for cash utilization. How do you define burn rate? Sorry, it is, what's the question? Is the burn rate? Yeah, what, how do you uh, define burn rate? Cash burn rate, yeah. Yes. It's your cash asset by when you your operation expenses. Yeah, it's your current asset divided on your daily operation expenses. Supposed to be plus or minus. It's the yeah. cash in the CBR, yeah. Yeah, basically, how quickly you, yeah, how quick you eat up the, the, eat up the expense, your capital. Yeah, it's very good. Cash burn rate. Cash burn rate, yeah, CBR. It's your current asset divided on your daily operation expenses. Okay, wonderful. We hand it back to the podium now. All right, great. <laughs>
so moving things along, uh, you know, hopefully by now you can see the, the natural progression uh, between all these different statements, how they flow through from the income statement to the statement of retained earnings all the way to the balance sheet. Um, so when you look at the retained earnings, uh, if you have a lot of wealth being built up in the company, uh, we have this thing called credit approval because uh, you're, you're basically exposing yourself to any liability of the company if uh, anything does go wrong. Um, people do have first right against your, your assets. So one way that we like to uh, protect some of our clients is to pay out dividends of like the wealth is being extracted from the company, either going to the hands personally, or if we can set up a, a company, like a holding company on top of the operations, we can pay a dividend um, out there. So at least the, the operations is protected against any sort of liability that it might be exposed to. Uh, I'm not going to get into the second point because that's a lot to do with uh, more tax planning. Um, but we do also encourage dividends for tax planning. Um, so we're able to recoup some of the tax paid uh, up front. Uh, but again, I'm not going to get into that because it doesn't really address our top three right here. Uh, but moving along to analyzing the, the cash flow statement, um, we're basically looking for, for major inflows and outflows of cash. Uh, are the operations producing any cash? Uh, so if you see that you're, you know, you have three different product lines, uh, one is struggling and one is your, your, your I guess your cow in, in a sense, uh, you know, you probably want to focus a little more time on one that's producing you more cash than not. Um, but that's based on your strategy. Uh, you know, are you, is the company or as a shareholder or the owner, are you investing any of that in surplus cash? Um, which could also be a good idea just to, you know, make some more money on on top of what you're producing as a product or service, um, or if you had to obtain any financing, you know, has the company put itself into some sort of liquidity uh, jeopardy? And overall, uh, is the company generating cash? Uh, do you see that this product or service that you're bringing to the market is a viable product or service? Um, so the cash flow is helpful um, through every step of the way. So it's a, a good statement to use um, to, to monitor your business performance. Uh, so we're going to go through a couple of statements. Talia is going to take you through the first one. Um, I don't know if she is going to introduce. Well, I, this is um, basically, it's called NUCO because it's a first year statement. It's um, what would be expected after your, your first year of operations. It only has one column because there is no prior period. Uh, we assume it's a, a full year, though, like 12 months. So there's certain things that you look at right away. Um, firstly, there's cash. So that means you're in a good position. You look at your cash and your inventory. Um, their numbers are large. That you're in a healthy position. Your your company is is performing. Equipment is the items that basically you bought to computers, furniture. It could be manufacturing equipment. It could be other equipment, equipment that you're using in your operations. They are depreciated, of course, over their useful life. But that's separate. So you look at your liabilities, you have your accounts payable, you have your taxes payable. The most immediate liability you have usually is your taxes payable. It's due probably fairly shortly if it's it's either payroll taxes or it's corporate taxes. They're due, you know, coming up. So you look at your cash, you say you have $136,000. That covers your taxes payable, your 54 off the bat. You then have your remainder, which is about 80000 and you have 101000 of accounts payable. So what you look at is terms. What are your terms from your suppliers and your vendors? Not everything is due on that day. You can some of the 45 days, 60 days. Take that into account. You take your cash that you have now, and whatever you need to pay off now, pay off. Everything else, defer until you have more cash, obviously. Um, if you would look at your current ratio in this in this example, it would probably be a, a little over two. So meaning you have more than two times assets to pay off your current obligation. That's okay. Um, the other thing that you look at in this, um, on this balance sheet is you'll see your retained earnings. Your retained earnings are 242000 That, of course, is your seed money that you put in originally, <coughs> the money you put in, plus the earnings that you've I guess in this case, it would be the earnings just from the year. If it was a, a company which was further down the road, it would be all the years that you've kept your earnings in. That builds up into there. The next slide Thank you. Is, um, is, your, oh, okay, is your balance at the beginning of the year. Obviously, it's a new company, um, so you have no balance, right? Because you, you just started. You have your net earnings. 
which is what you've earned during the year that comes straight from your income statement and goes into your retained earnings. And then you have dividends paid, that's money you've taken out, the $46,000, either you or a, another shareholder is taken out. So you get left with $240,000. That sits in your retained earnings, builds up the equity in your company, builds up the value. Next we have the income statement. So you have your sales and your, and your other consulting fees, a million dollars. You have your cost of sales, which was $629,000. So you look at what your gross profit is. Your gross profit is 408,000, meaning that for the 600,000 that you spent, you made 400,000 on that. You made 40%. So you did okay. Next we have our operating expenses. These are the expenses, these are your fixed costs, the items that will happen regardless of whether you sell any units or not, you will have to cover these costs. So you look at it, it's $66,000. That's one year of fixed expenses. You have cash, let's say, of $136,000. You know that you can cover your fixed costs for more than two years. If all else being, if you don't sell anything, you'll be able to cover your fixed costs for two years. So it gives you a little bit of comfort in your working capital and your, that you, you're okay. Um, provision for tax, unfortunately, that comes every year. And that's just fact of life. <laughs> Fact of a part of doing business. And then you have your net earnings, which is 288000 um, You, of course, can take that from your, that's your sales minus your cost of goods sold minus your operations. That's a basic, you know, first year. Lauren? Okay, so then we have ABC Company. ABC Company uh, definitely struggled uh, looking to, I guess, get back into more or less the black, get their retained earnings back where they should be. This company's in a deficit, uh, so they don't have of these earnings that are built up in the company. So a few things that I want to draw your attention to, if you look at the AR balance from uh, current year to prior year, uh, you can see there's tighter controls on the AR. Uh, so we're getting more cash in the company uh, sooner. We're not letting the AR drag on. Uh, so if, you're, if you need cash, uh, definitely put more emphasis on getting the AR um, to be more current. Don't let it drag on to 90, 120 days. Um, you can definitely see that the equipment, we're not making any capital expenditures, which is good because we don't have that much cash. Uh, the accounts payable, still growing. Definitely, there could be a, a management bonus in there, uh, but if your payables are continually growing, you might uh, eventually, uh, I guess, disrupt the, the vendors that you're dealing with. Uh, they might not want to deal with you anymore, so you, you kind of want to keep a close eye on that. Make sure that you, know, you have good relations with those vendors, um, because it looks like you do have uh, your terms are a little bit longer than um, probably a normal period of you know, 30, 60, 90 days. It looks like these have been sitting around for a while. Uh, as Talia mentioned, you have about $37,000 of tax payable. That's immediate need. If you see you have a cash balance of $12,000, you can't really suffice clearing that balance. So that is a, a problem in itself. Um, you know, There's ways to go around it. You can speak to the CRA, come up with some sort of strategy to pay them off, but that usually doesn't work. Uh, so you got to keep in, in mind, you know, you got to keep the cash in the company to satisfy all of these liabilities. Uh, but you'll see the shareholder advances, which you were talking about before. Uh, if you put money in the company, this is what would be owed to you on a tax-free basis. And pretty much uh, the overall picture, when I look at this uh, balance sheet, you know, the company is being pretty much financed by debt. Uh, and, 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 you know, they're definitely making a stride to turn things around. Uh, but, you know, if you use all the, the formula, the, the ratios that we are going to provide you in the appendix, you'll see that, you know, everything is not looking as great as uh, this $107,000 uh, total assets on the balance sheet. Uh, the retained earnings, uh, you know, again, it's the statement of deficit here, so, you know, they don't have any retained earnings. Um, the company, again, struggling. So we'll move on to the last. Uh, I guess point of our slide before we come to the to the end here uh, is really the statement of earnings for this company. Uh, you know the gross margin is definitely decreasing. Prior year was around 63 percent. Current year is around 43 percent. Uh, so you know as the owner of the business, you're going to want to figure out why are you uh, decreasing your margins? What costs are going into the product or service that you're providing to the to the market, um, and why it's increasing so much? Is it viable to continue in that? direction, you know, it kind of gives you the strategic point of view of how to cut those costs to bring that margin back up uh, to where it used to be. Um, and a few of these expenses here, 
like advertising and promotion, office in general, uh, telephone. You know, those those are areas that you know, from a management point of view, you can probably be a little more, uh, I guess, brutal. Definitely a little more for it. Uh, you know, to to bring your operations back to where uh, they were at one point in time. Uh, but certain things like rent, those are going to be fixed. Uh, you're probably in a lease, uh, so you're going to have to pay those costs regardless. Uh, but definitely your advertising and promotion is pretty high for this type of operation. Uh, so that would probably be an area that I would look at uh, when evaluating my income statement. And uh, definitely will give the advice to this client you know, to, to look at these type of expenses and how they can reduce them. And... As Alan, I think, uh, mentioned before in your presentation with the amortization, or I think it was Ellie, maybe, uh, the amortization, non-cash, uh, so, you know, obviously that's a, an accounting entry that we put through. Um, again, it's, a, it's based on management estimate, uh, but it's a non-cash item. So, again, as I promised, we will provide these slides online, so you can definitely consult them in terms of uh, finding out what each of the ratios do. We put a brief description there, so we're not going to go through them at this point in time, uh, but we gave you a, a few ratios to use when you're analyzing your own financial statement. And, and hopefully after this course, you guys are ready to go home and prepare that financial statement. Uh, if not, you can always... Uh, if uh, that's a call, right? More. <laughs> uh, so we do have a, a top five. Uh, I don't know if we have more questions. Oh, so we have some oh. time. Well, we're we'll get to the end. We'll just go through our top five highlights, and then we can ask as many questions oh, as yeah, we want. Please, please. Uh, so hopefully, we we touch on the the top three right here of how to read a financial statement, how to manage your cash flow. Hopefully we've made it somewhat fun, uh, but I guess, you know, at the end of the day, uh, Ellie says it best, the product that you're going to bring to the market uh, is really what's going to define fun. Uh, when you start making those millions of dollars, uh, that's when it becomes pretty fun and you get into the black. Obviously, that's, that's fun. Uh, so our, our top five, all me, uh, <laughs> always make sure working capital is sufficient to fund a couple of months of obligations. Uh, budget needs to be... Budget needs to be consistent with business plan and goals. Your budget needs to be conservative. Uh, that is an accountant talking, so we're ultra conservative. We don't like to take that many risks. Uh, always plan for contingencies and emergencies. Budget should be revisited yearly, but monitored continuously. Hopefully those are uh, a great takeaway for you guys when you're out there, again, depending on what uh, stage you're at in your operations. Um, so hopefully you're able to implement that uh, as you go along. Besides that, thank you very much. Yes, any questions? questions? Yeah, Alan, you have a question. Oh, we can do the draws. Oh, we, have a, we have a question card? also. <laughs> yes. Last call for yeah. business cards? Last call. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Can you put the uh, slide back up? Yeah, no problem. Can everyone get the business card in? Lauren, go ahead. No, no, you please. You do the honors. I have to do the top five. <laughs> Alex Brogans. Uh, oh, all right. There you go. Come on, we just yeah. brought some books that were related to our topic. Thank you so much. You'll find fun reading. Can say hello to our uh, webinar guests. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> I'm not saying a name. Here. Tesh Sangani. Oh, that table, you're lucky. Oh, you're, you're the shiny <laughs> card. Sit with the next one. How many cards did you put in? in <laughs> Only a couple. <laughs> Only a couple? I don't know. Any other okay. questions? Questions? Yeah. Um, this is the general rule of thumb where you have your corporate uh, tax at average of 15% uh, that corporations pay for. Uh, is this tax off the, uh, the gross profit or the revenues uh, um, that you make to CRA? It's, we, it's the net income, but it, there's items that go out for accounting and in for tax. Like for instance, amortization is an accounting item. Um, there's something called capital cost allowance, 
which would be the tax type of depreciation. And so your amortization would get added back to your net income and your CCA would get deducted to get your taxable income. It's you pay your 15.5% on your taxable income, which is not always your net income. It's not your revenue though, and it's not your gross profit. You, you, you take your operating expenses from those, and then you have to add or minus certain tax items. Uh, the, the biggest one, like with all my dentist friends who, who think that every time we go out for dinner they can write off that meal. Right, meals and entertainment. Uh, meals and entertainment are only 50% deductible. So if you want to put that huge $80,000 advertising promotion and that's all um, you know, meals and entertainment, that's going to be only 50% deductible. So you'll, you'll have to add that 40000 to get your taxable income. Thank you. Yeah? Um, for a startup and a very small company, what would you suggest as thank you? What would you suggest as the accounting tool, the perfect accounting tool, other than Excel spreadsheet? Oh yeah, um, I love Excel. QuickBooks. <laughs> QuickBooks is better than uh, account. Oh, there is another one that's. There's simply accounting. There's simply there's accounting. Simply there's accounting. accounting. But we're not soliciting one product. Absolutely not. We're on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Although Any people want to call us. <laughs> yeah, quick, quick. Any more questions? Maybe the only defect in QuickBooks only is not support multi currency. If you have a branch outside, okay, with two exporting, you don't have any other currency, only dollars. Hello. That we do. Yeah, you have a question? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, at the start of your talk, you mentioned about assets and capital amount, this budget amount in the assets. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the equipment, what you showed me there, was it the depreciated assets or yes, the Yes, it, it would be the net book value, which is the original cost yes. minus the amortization. Yes. That's correct. Great. And it would be, if we had notes to a financial statement, it would have you shown would have shown the historical cost, the accumulated uh, depreciation. But you're right, that one is not shown as its original cost. And one more question, um, and I don't have a perfect example, but is there a magic recipe to help to define your selling cost? As a, you have a new product and you're not sure at what price you should uh, sell it, yes, you have the uh, information about the competitor, and yes, you have your cost, Oh, is there a magic formula that you can use, or? Because earlier in the, in the, Alan, I think in one of the, one your your presentation, you were saying that well, you have to verify year after year uh, if uh, in your um, financial statement what goes right, what goes wrong, and for instance, you have to define is if my selling price is the right one. Is there the right? Uh, I think you have to do a lot of research on the type of product you're selling and what other people in the in the business, other other companies, are, are selling it for. And it's based on research. If you've got a new product, you have to find something that's comparable. And there, like you said, there there really isn't a magic wand. You know, say, okay, this is what it should be sold for. Um, you know, you, if you want to use Apple and, and the product they sell and the iPad, you know, or any other, if you think of any other technology, when they started coming up with um, flat screen TVs, I remember when we were looking at it, it was a 50 inch screen TV was Three thousand dollars. They obviously looked at what the cost was and how much they could sell, and was it something somebody really wanted to, to buy? And they s spent the money. Now you can get the same size for well under a thousand because of technology. So you've got to see well, what does it cost you to produce it, and is there a market for that product so you can make some profit? And people are willing to be the, the, the early adapters of, of that product, and it takes a lot of research. And, and knowing what, why people are going to buy it, not what you're trying to sell, but why do you, know, you believe in that product, and, and you think people will believe in that product, and are willing to be the first to, to go and buy it. And then, of course, there'll be economies of scale as the product becomes, you know, becomes more mature. So there's no magic elixir. It's a lot of hard work and, and research. Thank you. And through the hard work, you end up at a figure 
the highest price that Mommy can bear. And that keeps changing with our computers. Any more questions? So you say you do have templates online. And, uh, oh, yeah, I think we'll leave. Yeah, the signs will be on our website. Uh, okay. Both the videos and uh, presentations. Okay. Yeah, if you want to watch us again. We'll again, we're signing. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good.